Hi, welcome to Culturally Determined. I'm your host, Arya Cohen-Wade, and my guest today is Amanda Mull. Um, Amanda, could you introduce yourself? Hi, uh, I'm Amanda. I'm a freelance writer specializing in fashion uh, on top of all sorts of other stuff. Uh, thanks so much for coming on today. Uh, you wrote a couple interesting pieces over the past couple weeks um, that I wanted to talk to you about. Um, the first one uh, was headlined, uh, Body Positivity is a Scam, and it ran in Racked. And yep. we will have the link uh, below the video for people who want, who want to check it out. Um, so how would you define body positivity for someone who's never heard of it before? Um, I guess the the contemporary definition of it uh, that, the, that the article sort of contends with um, is the idea uh, that that it is somehow a, a political statement to feel to feel good about one's body um, and to and to encourage others to feel good about their bodies, no matter uh, what their what their level of adherence is to sort of contemporary beauty norms and standards. Mm-hmm. Um, so I guess I've like learned about this term in the past I don't know five or so years. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you write that it has had like its origins in the more of a in a, like a actual political movement in the 1960s? Yes. Uh, body positivity is sort of one, one facet of the larger, uh, more radical fat acceptance movement that started in the 1960s, um, which was also, uh, in addition to, to the idea that loving your body, no matter what it is, is radical, uh, also engaged in, uh, in activism of other sorts, anti-discrimination, activism, anti-capitalist activism, um, so, so it was essentially a, a mindset that body positivity then was a mindset that had, um, also some action tied to it that was not simply internal. Mm-hmm. Okay. So why, why is it a scam? Uh, well, because the brands stole it, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, it got turned into a scam over the over the course of the past like decade or so, I would say, um, in 2000, I believe it was 2004 that Dove, which is a Unilever company, um, collaborated with Ogilvy and Mather, which is a, a giant, um, advertising firm, um, to, it started with a, um, a photo exhibit in, um, in Toronto of women photographers, uh, which, then eventually grew into uh, what is now known as the Dove Campaign for Real Beauty, which most people are probably familiar with, even if they don't realize that's what its name is, um, which uh, which took the concept of body positivity and, um, and, and coupled it to a soap brand. Um, and they're uh, essentially... So, these, so the most iconic of these ads were the ones where it's women who seem to be not professional models like real women as are sometimes in ads um, where, and they're all wearing like matching like white or off white underwear and their bodies do not, are not the type of typical bodies that you would see in a, you know, advertisement of, of women wearing underwear. Yes. Those are uh, most people, even if they haven't watched the, the video components of the campaign, the campaign has run for like 10 years um, in, in different facets. Um, I have probably seen those ads in magazines on billboards and, um, there's, they sort of, you know, they, they run the gamut from, you know, slender white women to slightly less slender, slightly less white women. <laughs> um, uh, all, all wearing, uh, you know, matching uh, sort of neutral underwear and, uh, and, and declaring that all, all of the people in the ad are beautiful. Uh, and then the, uh, and, in, and it's important to remember, especially in 2006, that that message did read is sort of subversive to a lot of people um, because the, the the average consumer was not as aware of image editing as they are now, uh, was not as, not as aware of uh, like the, the cultural conversations around beauty standards just were in a really, really different place than they are today. Um, so I, so it, you know, it struck a lot of people as sort of refreshing for, for a brand to even acknowledge um, that the beauty industry was largely largely negative toward women, 
uh, in, in its messaging up to that point. Um, so, uh, so the first ads garnered a ton of attention and positive press. Um, so Dove went on to create, uh, you know, numerous additional phases of the campaign uh, that included videos and uh, that all that all went viral, I believe. And I think the, the most recent phase of it was uh, Dove creating a bunch of different shaped bottles for body wash. So like some were tall and slender and some were short and round, um, which sort of demonstrates to you the, the this entire idea has been sort of turned into a nonsense game by the advertising industry. Yeah, that that caught a lot of backlash online. It's is maybe the first part of this campaign that really everyone was kind of in agreement, at least online, that uh, this was a giant miscue because, you know, it was like, so here's a pear-shaped, you know, body lotion or, or soap uh, container. But then, you know, some of them, like, there's a reason that, like, containers – maybe have like a slight hour, hourglass shape, which is so you can hold it when you're in the shower. It doesn't like slip out of your hands and right. like, it'll stand up. And, and, they're, and they're all sort of uniform for like product merchandising reasons for like stores to put them on shelves in, a, in an organized way in a specific space that they reserve for a particular brand. Um, it, it's sort of uh, like, like as the, as the campaign has gone on, the first viral video that they did was, uh, was the deconstruction of, of how, um, an image in a in a in an average beauty ad might be manipulated by Photoshop, uh, but but the the longer it's gone on, the the more decoupled the idea has has gotten from from any sort of like bad act from acknowledging that there's like a bad actor in any of this that this is like a, a wide cultural phenomenon and not just something that like oh if we sh- if we show women a fat um, body wash bottle. <laughs> <laughs> then, then we will then we will demonstrate to them that we value them, um, and I think that that over time, not only has not only has Dove gotten a, gotten a little bit um, cavalier about what they think women will uh, will receive as positive, but I think the cultural conversations about about bodies and about uh, corporate politics and corporate progressivism and what that really means have have changed a lot. Um, and I think that consumers are sort of ready to move on from this idea. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it's, it's interesting. And I, I remember um, when the, uh, when the first part of the campaign came out, or at least what some of the early stuff, my then girlfriend, now wife was like positive about it and thought it was reflecting, you know, so it, what it did seem to be like, or at least it was, it, it could be taken as a kind of more genuine, like, attempt to like do something good that wasn't just selling you know yeah. soap um but maybe they've run out of ideas or yeah maybe there's the conversation has has moved beyond them um yeah i'm just i'm gonna read a striking line from from the essay uh, you write uh, the cultural narrative about women's bodies was so bad that simply identifying the problem would get dove full credit and move plenty of product but the urge to talk about a broad cultural problem or refusing to name a bad actor left the blame squarely on the shoulders of the women who had the temerity not to love themselves sufficiently. So that's kind of part of your critique is that, um, yeah, you're like the, who was the villain, as you mentioned earlier, and is it, is it just other brands saying it's just, you know, if you don't love your body, then that's your own fault. Right. Yeah. The, the, after that first, that, that initial dove ad, which sort of did put the blame on, beauty companies uh, for how they've been manipulating images. All, all of the ads after that, and, and, and not just Dove, but a lot of the, a lot of the companies that ran campaigns that this was, that were inspired by um, the, the response to the Dove ads um, have sort of adopted this like view from nowhere uh, in their, uh, in their point of view, um, which, which goes ahead and acknowledges that the way, the way that women, view themselves and the way that women are encouraged to view themselves is a problem. Um, but just identifying a problem doesn't, isn't helpful. Um, if you're not going to acknowledge how, how any of that came about or why it came about. Um, so if you're not willing to, to name a bad actor, if you're not willing to um, unpack exactly, exactly how cultural structures affect women, uh, which brands are not willing to do, and brands shouldn't be the people doing it in the first place. 
But if you're going to go down that road and not name a bad actor, then then who's at fault except for the women who don't, who should feel better about themselves? The, the women who feel badly are the only, are the only humans participating in this problem as far as, as far as this uh, viewpoint goes. Right. So who, um, who, okay. So the brand, so the, a brand is not going to identify like a villain um, because sometimes the brand itself is the villain and, right. um, you- and so, you know, it's, it's probably not a good way to sell your product. Um, who, were, who are the villain or villains in your opinion in this story? Um, I mean, the, most of the, most of the bad cultural phenomenon phenomena that we're, that we're, you know, subject to are, are sort of the, a combination of, are sort of the result of a combination of, you know, uh, capitalism and cultural misogyny and patriarchy, like, uh, and racism. Uh, cause a lot of times, uh, those things intersect, um, you know, poverty is general is often tied, uh, tied with being overweight being um, being a person of color is often tied with, with poverty, which is then also tied with being overweight. So we we punish people for for having larger bodies because we as a culture we hate poor people, we hate women, we hate people of color. Um, so so we read. I think a lot of people maybe without realizing it look at fat people and see somebody who is probably poor and probably, you know, it intersects with a lot of these other things that we, that we find culturally unpalatable. Uh Um, And another thing that we can, that we can punish women for. And, you know, fat bodies are disobedient and, you know, American culture values female obedience and female and women being, you know, controlling themselves Uh uh, and making themselves smaller and making themselves quieter. Um, so I think that, that we really have like a perfect storm of all these like cultural phenomena here um, for, for reasons that people get, um, that, that people aren't valued or that people are discriminated against. And they sort of, you know, um, they sort of all dovetail into how, pe- how we re- react to people with different bodies, whether that's gender or, or race or class. Um, okay, so these are huge problems: patriarchy, capitalism, um, racism. Yeah. That obviously no corporation is going to solve. And yeah, they can't do anything about that. So why and, should they profit on acknowledging it exists? Yeah, and and normal people can try just strive in their own lives to fight against them. But you know, in the near future, we are not going to dismantle them. Um, do you yeah. think that the do you think that the body pos- positivity movement divorced from the strictly corporate advertising branding angle is a good thing for women uh, to see better representation of their, the, their bodies or someone who has a similar body on, you know, like a billboard or something like that. I think representation is important. Um, but I think it's a first step. Um, because like the real problem is that people are treated differently because of the bodies they live in, whether it's the size of the body or the color of their body or the gender of their body, their gender presentation. Um, ultimately people feel better about themselves when they feel like, when they feel like they're valued as humans overall. And when they feel like they have, they have uh, equal opportunities and equal, um, and equal treatment when they, when they, you know, go into a job interview or something like that. Um, so I think, while I think representation is important, it's important for people to see different kinds of different kinds of people uh, doing different kinds of things. Um, the ultimately, what what determines how somebody experiences the world is how people treat them, you know, in day to day life, mm-hmm. and how how their how the body in which they go out into the world helps determine that. So until there's some sort of like actual change in how, you know, in the, in the any of the dynamics that, that intersect with, with this, I, I think that representation is only, is only so much until there's some sort of meaningful change. Mm-hmm. 
Um, so uh, my wife is into the body positivity concept and she, I think she primarily gets as interacted with it recently through um, Instagram and mm-hmm. people who she follows on Instagram who are like Instagram models or something or, you know, just regular people who post uh, images of themselves and they are overweight or fat or however you want to call them. And she says that curating her Instagram feed in that way, and we also don't uh, have cable TV or, or get much broadcast network, so we don't see a lot of uh, TV ads either in, this, in my household, um, that she has, like, it has sort of, like, changed her mindset in some ways that, like, you know, her body is not an aberrant body, and there's uh, other women out there who are flaunting their bodies who have a similar body. Do you, like, what do you think of that? I think that it's definitely true that, that being um, sort of an, an active and aware consumer of media and, under, and knowing that there's a problem and sort of taking steps, whether it's creating your own Instagram feed or, or, or reading about the problem, problems that, that contribute to this or whatever, uh, can, can make a meaningful personal change in how you approach your own body. Um, like definitely, definitely following along with... Uh, with people who um, who have bodies that are that are more like mine, um, and who feel and who feel good about their bodies, and who who have you know have radical messaging as part of their uh, their internet presence has uh, has made a big difference in how I view myself. Mm-hmm. And I think that's important because uh, I, I think that that's uh, that that can be a start to the sort of radicalism in the sort of figuring out exactly what these problems are, figuring out who the bad actors are. Um, so yeah, I would say definitely being, being like an active and aware consumer of media is, is super important, um, which I would say is not the same thing as, as brands, you know, using a, using a couple, a couple plus size models of profit uh, based on uh, these more radical ideas. That, that other people have been trying to get into the mainstream for a long time. Mm-hmm. And then there's, you know, there, uh, there's a probably more people <laughs> experience a negative side from Instagram in terms of body image with professional models or Instagram models or these like people who are, you know, aggressively trying to lose weight and develop eating disorders and kind of brag about it. There's like the, these communities. Um, yeah, so I would say pro- social media <laughs> is at best a double-edged sword and probably a net negative overall for this. Yeah, the the ecosystem of Instagram and bodies is really really fascinating and something I want to write more about uh, because, like, at the on the same platform in, in, on which exists this sort of this sort of radical community of people agitating not only for uh, not only to help people you know start uh, transforming how they think about themselves like in a in a real way, not in just a you know, maybe I could be in an ad type of way, um, but on uh, but on locating the people who have who are the the the, agent, the bad actors who have who have created this. There's also this this flip side to it that is the Instagram wellness community, which <laughs> is is sort of like a a dismaying place. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, because there's a lot, there's a lot of people who seek out that content, who are, who are genuinely interested in, 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 in feeling better. Um, and I think that some of them get funneled into things that make ultimately make them feel worse. Mm-hmm. Um, because the cultural messages about, about what you, what you have to be in order to feel better um, are so bad in certain sectors, you know? Yeah, and I wonder if there's um, there was this op-ed piece that ran in the Times a couple months ago by uh, a woman whose name I don't know exactly how to pronounce, something like Zeynep Terfeki, um, that was about how like if you start watching YouTube videos that are like pro-Trump, like soon you start seeing like alt-right videos, and then you're seeing like <laughs> neo-Nazi videos. Like the algorithm is programmed to like show you more and more extreme things of what you're interested in. So I wonder if you know that kind of thing works <laughs> in a similar way in this in this situation. Yeah, I think it does because I think there are a lot of people who who get to a point where they're sort of fed up with you know feeling bad about themselves and fed up with um, with uh, feeling like they can't do anything about it, 
And culturally, our answer to that has always been to like, go on a diet, go to the gym, you know, uh, if you if you don't feel good in your current body, or if you feel like people react negatively to you in your current body, then you should change your body. Um, so I think that because that's so many people's first impulse of where to look, um, of what direction to look in when they, when they, you know, are feeling bad about themselves, that the algorithm sort of does reward you for being, for, you know, going in more and more extreme, uh, directions. And I think something, something about this ran actually earlier this week in Wired, um, about how Instagram, how algor algorithms can stoke eating disorders. Oh, uh -huh. Um, for people who weren't necessarily, didn't necessarily have full blown eating disorders to begin with. And it can help push them into that because of, because of how algorithms, like you said, sort of encourage you know, more and more extreme paths, the more, the more stuff you consume. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that, you know, Instagram is sort of a, a choose your own adventure. And if you, if you get onto it looking for, looking for, you know, encouragement or information or non-dominant ideas, um, about, about yourself and about, uh, and about how to change how you're feeling. And it might, you might get, you know, get lucky and get funneled into these more, these more radically accepting communities, or you might end up with an eating disorder, <laughs> uh, just depending on, uh, you know, the, the, the first couple steps you take. Yeah. Um, which is sort of a wild thing to to throw women into, mm -hmm. and, and you know some who are like children <laughs> and yeah, uh, a ton of you know thirteen year olds and fourteen year olds who um, who are just sort of uh, figuring out how they might be able to feel about themselves, mm -hmm. like what their options are uh, for the first time. Uh, and if you take a couple wrong steps, the algorithm has decided that you need to go to the gym seven days a week mm -hmm. um, and not eat anything, uh, or only eat, uh, you know, or only eat raw plant-based food <laughs> or whatever. Um, and the, you know, and, it, and it's an open community; people can post whatever they want. But, but the ways in which we encourage people down particular paths of thinking about themselves probably deserves some interrogation. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that is your piece like an outgrowth of the feminist energy that has erupted around Me Too, um, or is it separate from that? I think it's separate from that. Um, I think that we're at a certain an interesting cultural turning point in a lot of aspects of feminism. Uh, how feminism affects sex, how it, how it affects work, uh, how it affects. Um, our relationships to our bodies uh, overall. And of course the, our relationships to our bodies intersect with, uh, with sex and work and, and all of those things. None of these issues are, it can be completely untangled from one another. Like you can't untangle um, racism from classism, from sexism, from, you know, uh, from any of this, they all, it's all one big knot. Um, but mostly my, uh, my motivation in writing this is, and actually, the what we were saying about Instagram sort of gets at it is that I, I feel like we've reached sort of a, a tipping point on Instagram where where this I, where ideas of wellness and ideas of body positivity have become so diluted and widespread um, that the, the the irritation with it among among just average women among average media consumers people who aren't even necessarily super keyed into the particular dynamics. Uh, and, and ways that media has and feminism have, have changed um, are just sort of fatigued by all of this. Mm -hmm. uh, so mostly, mostly it was motivated by sort of seeing that tipping point starting to arise uh, and it feeling like like something that uh, that was some ideas that were worth like putting in one spot. For that moment, because I mean, the, the ideas that I'm talking about, that the, the real beauty campaign is, is bad and that corporations should get out of this and um, and it's condescending to women. These, those are not like especially new ideas. People have been talking about that for a long time uh -huh. uh, uh, in a lot of places. Uh, but it just felt like um, we had reached, a, like I said, a tipping point where enough women were sick of these dynamics that it was... 
that it was a, a good time to, to bring it all up again. Mm-hmm. Um, if we like had a, like a letter writing campaign and a boycott campaign and we like canceled the dove marketing campaign and all the other ones, like what from the body positivity movement or whatever we want to call it, like, what do you want to save? Um, I would save the sort of grassroots communities that have, that have built up to sort to talk about these issues, because I think that that is an important entry point uh, for a lot of people in, in, sort of in, in seeing the larger dynamics at work here uh, because it's a way to to look at how the dynamics have affected you and affected the ways that you think and, and that you interact with the world um, and uh, and determine that the problem is, the problem is not you it's not all in your head the problem is a, is a larger dynamic with how we think about women and people of color and poor people and and all of these things mm-hmm. um, so I think that that is a, a port, an important entry point um, and that those communities have, have very real, very lasting value. Um, so it's not necessarily a bad thing that the, that the idea of body positivity has, has gotten out into the world. Um, I just think that we're, that we're all ready to take the next step on it. Okay. Let's, um, let's move to a second piece that you wrote, um, that is, uh, kind of on a related topic. Um, this ran in the, on the website Nylon, and the uh, headline is The Self-Defeating Myth of Pulling It Off. Uh, can you talk about this piece a little bit? Yeah, I am. Uh, I write about a lot of stuff, like I said, that my background, uh, I've, I've covered the high-end fashion industry for 10 years. Um, and in the past five years, it seems to me um, that a lot of... Uh, you know, fashion has always has always valorized thinness and unhealthy thinness. Like fashion is not interested in anybody's health or anybody's well being. Fashion is interested in looking a certain way um, that has, was determined a long time ago, um, and uh, in adhering to those norms, uh, if at all possible. Fashion, fashion in in some parts of fashion are are extremely progressive, but a lot of dominant. Um, fashion institutions are, are, are super, super repressive. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and it seems like a lot of trends, especially in the past five years, are sort of predicated on the irony of beautiful people wearing the clothes of the ugly. <laughs> um, like so mom, yeah, so like mom jeans is like norm core. Yeah, um, a lot of norm core stuff, and that, and that has only gotten sort of more intense as it's gone on. Because like, you know, a twenty two year old, five ten, one hundred and twenty five pound woman wearing mom jeans is sort of like you look at it and you get the joke of immediately of like, oh, she's so beautiful and she's wearing this like, you know, these purposefully silly clothing pieces of clothing. Um, but if you if you look at someone who who has you know a body type more more commonly associated with moms, you know, where's the irony? There's no, you lose the visual irony. So uh-huh. the, the acceptance of these trends and the ability to wear them in the, in the mode preferred by fashion is entirely dependent on, on somebody being, being, you know, adhering as closely to standardized beauty norms as possible. Um, and that's what the, I mean, that's the basis of the trends. That's why they came about. Um, I got in like a little fight on Twitter <laughs> for saying that um, because about an article about one of these trends, which is prairie dresses. Um, I was not trying to get in a fight with the author. I just don't like prairie dresses um, for this reason, because I think they are sort of typical. Well, what, what is a prairie dress for someone who doesn't know? Oh, prairie dresses are sort of um, sort of high necked, long sleeved, long like ankle length uh sort of like sort of shapeless ruffled often floral print um they're sort of uh when you think of like what like a cowboy's wife might have worn on the frontier or something like that they're they're sort of based on on those sort of old structures they they sometimes they have like a puff sleeve like they're they're purposefully you know counter to uh a lot of you know prevailing aesthetic ideas about what might enhance someone's attractiveness. Mm-hmm. So it's it's kind of like what a Mormon sister wife, if that is a real thing, would yeah. would wear. 
fundamentalist. They're very um, sister wife. They're, you know, it's, a, it's an extremely difficult look to pull off. Um, and I think that um, sort of like how brands approach body positivity is saying like, if you just believe in yourself, you can feel better about yourself without acknowledging all the ways in which, you know, being a, a person in the world makes you feel bad about yourself. Um, these, you know, fashion outlets that sort of uh, promote these trends with like a, you know, are you confident enough to wear this? Don't acknowledge that the trends are for thin people and that your, your own self-confidence may not um, determine whether or not you can go out into the world and feel affirmed for wearing mom jeans or wearing a prairie dress or something like that, or, or whether or not those trends are even made for you. Um, it's, it's incredibly difficult to find uh, most high fashion trends in any sort of, in any sort of plus sizes. Um, so it doesn't come down just to how you feel about yourself. Uh, it comes down to if, you know, if you don't dress in something that makes you look as small as possible, are, are people going to treat you worse that day? Are people going to, you know, how's your, how's your boss going to react to that if you wear that to work? Um, things like that. Because, you know, the, the, the stereotypes about fat people are that they're sloppy and dirty and stupid and whatever. And, you know, wearing something that far outside of traditional norms you run the very real risk as a fat person of just casually to the people around you enforcing those norms that you, that you rolled out of bed and couldn't even put on something with a waistline, you know? Uh -huh. um, um, yeah. So you, you get like the micro interactions that you, that are very much affected by how you choose to present yourself. And then like, you know, having all the confidence in the world doesn't matter if, if things are not made in your size. Mm-hmm. You know, that there there are obstacles there. Um that it would be useful to acknowledge, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot there. So um as a as an unfashionable man, I was happy when I heard about Normcore because I realized it's the way I've been dressing since I was thirteen or so and and finally like the fashion wheel had turned to um you know, make me stylish for a, a brief couple of years. Um, I don't know if it's turned again since then, since I'm still wearing the same stuff. But um, why Why do you think that the, like, why is, like, per, being purposely ugly, why is that what we consider beautiful right now? Do you have any theories, like, why society has gone in this direction? Um, well, I think a lot of culture is sort of weird right now. And I think some of it is nostalgia, um, and just like the acknowledgement that a lot of the trends of like the late eighties and early nineties were not particularly attractive. Um, like, you know, the, the cuts on those jeans were not great. The, uh, the, the big puffy looking like dad sneakers were not great. Um, and I think that fashion has been, in, is always in a nostalgic mood and has been in a particularly nostalgic one recently. Um, but I think also that there's something that there's something very attractive to designers in, in, in pushing extremes. Uh, and if I think that to a certain extent, a lot of designers feel like they've pushed the extremes of beauty. Uh, but like, how about the extremes of ugliness? And how, how does that, you know, how, do, how does exploring ugliness as a concept um, stand in opposition to the ideas of beauty um, that we traditionally have? Uh, and also I think irony is just like a prevailing cultural viewpoint uh that is that goes way beyond fashion that has uh that has sort of gotten into every every nook and cranny of uh of a lot of people's view on on culture in america uh and in you know western europe which is like primarily where these fashion trends come out of um so i think that all of those things together sort of gave people the impetus to put a 22 year old model in you know, a pair of Jerry Seinfeld jeans and see what happened. Right. So for people who don't know what Normcore is, I, like the first definition I read of it was like, it's what Jer the kind of stuff Jerry Seinfeld wore, um, you know, in 1994. Um, yeah. It's just like the, the very, the, the, it's sort of like taking normal to its, to its most uh, visually extreme. It's, you know, crew neck, sweats crew neck sweatshirts and, bad jeans and, uh, and sneakers that are, that are purposely not cool. 
um, that are purposely sort of 90s um, and all of those things. And like, and like for women, the challenge there, fashion, the fashion industry is sort of, I guess most, most trends sort of propose a challenge to women. Like our, and when, when the fashion ideals were like super, super sexy during like the, the early 2000s, for example, the, the challenge was more straightforward. Like, do you adhere to beauty norms well enough to fit into this tiny, tight, you know, bodycon dress um, or whatever, or these like very, very low skin jeans. Uh, now the, the challenge is, is sort of more passive aggressive <laughs> and sort of like, are you beautiful enough to, to wear these awful clothes and, uh, and have people still respond to you positively? Like, can you, can you transcend the clothes? Can you make this look cool? Yeah. It's, it's pretty bizarre. I, I think, I mean, it's like, you're talking about the shoes. It's like, are you cool enough to wear shoes that aren't cool? Yeah. And, and that's like, like, what, does that mean like the uncool kids are wearing like cool shoes? <laughs> what do the uncool people wear when everyone else, when the cool kids are dressing uncool? Um, the uncool people wear d- like a different kind of uncool stuff or they wear the same stuff, but they just obviously don't get the joke. Okay, so it's like wearing a fanny pack ironically versus wearing a fanny pack sincerely. Yes. Yeah, the, the level of, of sincerity um, and the, the level of, uh, of visual and aesthetic adherence to, to one set of norms or the other, whether it's traditional beauty norms or, or your adherence to tr- the traditional aesthetic norms uh, as a person who, like, you know, spends a lot of time playing video games or something like that. Um, how well the rest of your body adheres to those norms determines how those clothes are then read on you. Um, so you, so, you know, the headline is pulling it off and it's kind of like, can you wear something that looks good, but, you know, looking good is subjective and pulling it off. Who decides who's the, who's the fashion arbiter who's deciding, deciding, you pulled this off. You haven't pulled this off. Um, and you, you kind of said like, is it all in your head? Is it self-confidence? Like, yeah, I, I don't know exactly what my question is, but like, are you like giving society too much power, uh, to judge a potential outfit on a non-standard body? Uh, can you be like, I'm wearing this and fuck all you guys. <laughs> it makes me feel good. You know, I, I don't care what you think. Yeah, well, I mean, you certainly can do that if the if the clothes are available to you. There's like a there's a huge practical uh, barrier for a lot of plus size women, and that there there just aren't that many clothes available to us. Um, like if you go in an average department store, um, maybe two or three percent of the of the overall floor space is dedicated to plus size women's clothing. Um, so you get like a so everybody else gets a full floor. Um, while we get like a corner in the back somewhere. Um, so a lot of these trendier things are just like not going to exist to try. Um, so in that case, no matter how good you feel about yourself, no matter how cool you think, you know, you, you think you are and how much you want to wear a thing, the thing might not exist. Mm-hmm. To put on. Um, so manifestly it does not matter how you feel about yourself in those situations. Uh, and then if you, if you find something ultra trendy that does fit your body, um, like I wear a lot of wasteless stuff. I wear a fanny pack, uh, but I work in, I work in fashion. Um, my, you know, my ability to adhere to tra- traditional beauty norms does not make a great deal of difference in my career. Uh, especially because, you know, I, um, I write about these things for a living and point out these problems for a living. Um, so like, my, my ability to be socially supported in making these decisions for myself uh, is different than somebody who, who is going to go to tr- a traditional office and their boss might be an asshole and their coworkers might sit there and judge them for what they eat for lunch every day because they're 20 pounds overweight and not controlling themselves like they think they should. Mm-hmm. So a person, and, and that's like the everyday reality for so many women. Um, my, my case is really atypical personally. Um, so if you're in that kind of situation where you are, where, you know, your, your workplace, you know, runs annual weight loss contests, that everybody has to participate in and, and stuff like that. Um, where, where your ability to control your body and be small, uh, 
affects so much your uh, your social interactions, your professional interactions, things like that. Um, you know, that the calculus on deciding what you're going to wear every day is just different in those situations. You, you probably, just for self-preservation purposes, just to make your day a little bit less miserable with those awful coworkers and that awful boss uh, or whatever, um, you're probably just going to say, you know, wearing, wearing this purposely ugly thing, no matter, no matter how cool I think I might look at it, it's just probably not worth it um, because of the, the potential, you know, the, you know, the girl that sits at the next desk snickering behind, behind your back about you or whatever, uh-huh. um, or how like potential friends or romantic partners might perceive you. Um, the reality is just that a lot of people's awareness of this stuff is just bad and people will judge you for it. So if you, the, the calculus that you have to do about going out into the world and deciding to flout these norms is just different um, than somebody who has a body that adheres better to uh, traditional beauty standards. Uh-huh. Um, I would say being aware of that power and how that affects people's decision making is not giving it, is not giving it too much credence. It's just being realistic. Um, yeah. Uh, maybe this is the last question. Um, how do you think, uh, online shopping changes or affects this conversation? Um, when I, 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 my wife read your article and we were talking about, uh, what questions to ask you. And she mentioned that, you know, online shopping and, uh, and seeing, you know, the plus size models in those, uh, online stores, uh, has like, she does almost all of her shop, all of her clothing shopping online now. And that makes her feel a lot better. And um, yeah, so she doesn't have to go to the department store where it's just a little corner set aside uh, for, for plus size women. Um, so yeah, what, what effect do you think that's having? I think that's really good. I think it's uh, it's opened up a lot of, of options for plus size women that didn't exist before. Almost all of my shopping is done online. Um, it's encouraged, I think, more big retailers to try out having plus size lines because um, the barrier of entry is lower. They don't have to immediately assign floor space um, and, and financially make that financial dedication to it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think it's it's opened up a lot of options, and it's also given indie brands, smaller brands that, that were founded to serve plus size women above all others, um, a way to reach customers that they wouldn't necessarily have if they had to have brick and mortar locations. Um, so I think that the internet has has opened up those options in important ways, um, but it's still it's still a bummer to have to buy everything online. Like I don't remember what it's like to shop for clothing in person basically anymore. Despite being someone who who works in fashion, um, the concept of of getting to go into a store and try on a couple things and walk out with something I like just like doesn't really exist for me. It doesn't exist for a lot of women. Um, so I think that while the internet is important. Um, the, the flexibility in, and the option of, of buying a thing in person, if one so chooses, is important. Especially when like trying new trends, when trying stuff that, um, that hasn't been available for your body before. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, you know, instead of, instead of paying $70 or 100 bucks for a dress and getting it shipped to you and then having to ship, you know, pack it back up and take it to the UPS store if you don't like it, just the option of, of, of going in and, and putting a thing on your body and looking at it in the mirror and then and then taking it off and leaving it is uh, is a convenience that a lot of people take for granted. Um, the plus size women don't have the option of taking it for granted. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think the, the internet has been important, but uh, the the inaccessibility of, of plus size clothing just you know in person is, is still a pretty significant problem for a lot of shoppers, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. Do you have anything else you want to add before we wrap up? Uh, I would say that like, just like the overall point of both pieces is that like the body you live in affects how you interact with the world. And I think that when people are sort of, even people who are sort of resistant to the idea of, uh, sorry about the siren. Oh, that's okay. Um, even when the, uh, the, people who are sort of resistant, resistant to the idea of talking about size in this way. Like if you just back it all the way out to being, to acknowledging that like the body you live in affects how people interact with you, affects how you interact with the world. Um, 
and that's the that's just like the overriding idea that I think is important to uh, apply to not only size but you know race, gender presentation, all kinds of stuff. Okay, cool. Um, thank you for coming on and taking the time uh, to discuss your interesting pieces. Um, if, if if people um, want to find more of your work, where can they find it? Um, well, I've written a bunch of stuff on this topic for Racked in particular, um, but you can always find me on Twitter at, at Amanda Mull. Um, I tweet everything right there. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I endorse your Twitter feed. It's very entertaining, and um, you have a very cute dog that you uh, take pictures of sometimes as well, so that's a bonus. Yes, um, yes please come for the dog content. If nothing else, I love to <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, uh, thank you Amanda thank you to our viewers and listeners and we'll see you again next time thank you for having me